think of a time you were ever stressed out by technology. It might have been that you were frustrated by a computer program, or you felt enslaved by your email or the notifications on your mobile phone. If you ever experience frustration, anger, because of a technology, please raise your hand now. <laughs> wow. We all have something in common. Now, I would like you to think of a time you felt connected to family or friends because of a technology. It may be that you felt a heartwarming glow or you had a sense of belonging to a community, and this was made possible by the technology. If you ever had a moment of connection to someone else because of a technology, please raise your hand. Thank you. Now, for my last challenge, I would like to be a bit more specific. I would like you to think of a time you empathize with someone else, with another human being, because of a technology. It might have been that you saw the world through someone else's eyes in a video game. Or maybe you heard a heartfelt story on a live video stream. Or you read a very candid post on a community forum. If you ever felt something of what someone else was feeling because the technology allowed you to connect to their experience, please raise your hand. Now hold it there, hold it there and look around. That's a lot, a lot of empathy. We know technologies have negative effects. They stress us out, they overwhelm us sometimes, they steal our focus, and all these issues are widely discussed, as they should be. But today I would like us to focus on how technologies of the future can do better, not have a negative impact on how they can help us thrive. Because that's how they're going to change the world for the better. When they help us think, act, and evolve the themes of today's event toward versions of ourselves that are happier and kinder and wiser. Because I think that's what technology should be doing. And I think they can. Now, first, uh, I need to confess something. I'm an engineer, and we are not known for being good with human emotions. <laughs> but geek that I am, I have a dirty secret. I have been secretly obsessed with understanding human nature. In fact, I'm a failed philosopher. Philosophy was a passion of mine when I was younger. Uh, but my parents somehow thought that it wouldn't pay the bills, philosophy. So they steered me away towards the hard sciences. I don't know why they thought that physics will pay for the bills. <laughs> and after years of being a software engineer and tweaking algorithms and building smart machines, the need to relate my work to more humanistic values kept coming back. I kept asking myself, how the work I was doing could help people be happier and kinder. How could it help them flourish? We engineers are really good, really good at making people more productive, tasks more efficient, algorithms more powerful, search engines more accurate. But is all this making us happier? Of course, we all have moments of happiness with technologies, and they have plenty of clear benefits. But is the overall improvement on our quality of life? So to answer that, I turned to the literature on psychology, neuroscience, and economics, and what I found is that the answer is no. Wealth and digital technology ownership has increased radically over the last few decades. But measures of well-being have hardly changed. How could it be? I mean, all these technologies, all this tweaking of algorithms, all this effort, all this investment, and we are not having an overwhelming impact on improving quality of life? How could we be failing this badly without even noticing? And that's when I had a realization. Maybe the reason technologies are not helping us be happier is because we don't design them to. 
We have put all our focus on productivity and sales, and maybe, just maybe, productivity and happiness are not the same thing. Crazy notion, right? So why don't we aim for gold and design for well-being directly? Think about it. Every chair we sit on, every keyboard we touch, has been ergonomically designed to respect our physical health. Shouldn't every technology we use be designed to respect our psychological health? How much happier will everyone in this room be if every app we open, every technology we use in the workplace, every device we carry in our pockets was designed to support our well-being? How different will be the experience for the next generation? But Rafa, I hear you say, productivity, sales, that's easy to measure, but thriving, well-being, that sounds very hippy-dippy. Is it even measurable? Is it scientific? It's a good point. But yes, the study of well-being is scientific. Is it complex? Absolutely. But neuroscientists, psychologists, economists have been working behind the scenes for decades, helping us understand it and measure it. We have people like Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman, who was developing measures of well-being decades ago. So measures of well-being are not new. In fact, they're being used in crazy things like insurance claims and economic policy. Why are we not using them in the design of technologies? So to give you an idea of how this will work, I want to take you back to the questions I asked you at the beginning. I asked you to think of a time where you were frustrated by a computer technology. And I asked you to think of a time where you felt connected or empathic towards someone else because of a technology. What these two experiences have in common is that they affected your well-being. For better or worse, these two experiences had an impact on one of three things that psychologists know are key to well-being. And these three things are, drum roll, autonomy, competence, and relatedness. It might not seem like much, but these three factors have shown to be the three most critical things for a healthy psychological functioning. When you get frustrated by a computer program, it is your autonomy and your competence that are taking a hit. That is stressful. When you feel enslaved by your email or the notifications, or you feel that you have lost control over your privacy, it is your sense of autonomy and competence that have been betrayed, that have been frustrated. Of course, technologies also have positive effects. They create new options, open new possibilities, allow you to do things that you couldn't do before, or do them better. Of course, there's a, a third factor, relatedness. Relatedness is about our positive connection to other human beings. Actually, sorry, I will include animals, but maybe that's just because I have a very cute dog. <laughs> relatedness is about our sense of belonging. It's about feeling part of a community. And we all here will have positive and negative examples where technologies connected us or disconnected us, right? Technologies have the potential to support or hinder our psychological well-being. So, it may not, uh, the, what's amazing about these three factors is that decades of research have shown that they predict well-being. If you mess up with one, well-being goes down. If you support another one, well-being goes up. In fact, this applies to all cultures and age groups. That's why researchers like 
Ryan and Desi call it basic psychological needs. As a bonus, these and other psychologists have developed techniques that allow us to compare what happens before and after an experience on these factors, so we can understand its effects. Shouldn't we be using this in the design of technologies? Now, why should well-being technologies, or what we call positive computing, look like? How will they be different? Well, they don't need to be different, obviously different. An ergonomically designed chair doesn't always look different, but its experience is very different to one you know, where the back is too low, the bottom too hard, and you end up the day with a terrible headache. Right? Sometimes they do look different, and this happens in digital technologies. In a sense, maybe this is what happened when we were all so attracted the first time we saw the iPhone. Now, its visual design held a promise. It looked like it was going to satisfy our psychological needs. We might not have understood this explicitly, but the first time we looked at it, we thought, Wow, that's going to be easy to use, a pleasure even. It's going to allow me to connect to others. It's going to allow me to do things that I couldn't do before. It's going to allow me or support my psychological needs. Of course, we were only making reasonable assumptions. Whether or not it happened is a much more complex question. Mobile phones do satisfy our psychological needs, but not every time and not in every way possible. If the overall net improvement, it's a very hotly debated question. What we know for sure is that we can do better, much better. Now, five years ago, sorry, one more thing there, it's important that we ensure that all technologies are designed to support well-being. And to do that, we need to bring the seeds of psychology into our design practice. It's not enough to say we want to make a, the world a better place, you know, like in that Silicon Valley cliche, or we want to make people happy. No, we need to bring uh, the scientific approach that is provable, measurable, reliable, reproducible. And five years ago, I committed myself to doing just that. So my team and I at the Positive Computing Lab in the University of Sydney stop developing for productivity and for behavioral tasks alone and started focusing on well-being as well. So now when a colleague comes and says, hey, can we develop an app to remind the, uh, asthma adolescents with asthma to take their medication? I say, hey, but let's build an app to support their autonomy and their sense of competence in managing their illness, an app that helps them connect to others. And we will look for ways in reminding them to take the medication. So the critical insights on how to design for well-being in any given technology should come in great measure from the users themselves. So in this project, it's a real project funded by Asthma Australia. We knew that there was more to it than just reminders. But we didn't know how the app will support their well-being. It was only until we got the young people into a room to share their experience and design the app with us that we did. So positive computing is really about, at a superficial level, problem solving. When there are well-being hindrances, we can redesign to solve them. At a deeper level, it is about understanding how your product connects to people's lives and then tapping into what is really important to them. Now, you might be asking, well, I'm not a designer. What can I do? Well, if you are a technology maker, an engineer, an entrepreneur, you can be a pioneer on well-being supportive technologies in positive computing. If you're not a technology maker, you're still a user. 
And as a consumer, you vote with your time, with your money, and increasingly with what you share on social media. So I ask you, raise your standards. We think we know what great design is. A technology can be sexy, gorgeous, high-tech, disruptive. But if it is addictive, is it still great design? If a technology promotes aggression, disconnects you from others, is it still great design? I think well-being support is a criterion for great design. So raise your expectations of what a technology should offer you. If it stresses you out, disrespects your privacy, disconnects you from others, turn them off, fight back. Fight for your right to be well because of technology, not in spite of it. If it uh, stresses you out, report that well-being bug to the comp technology company that produced it. Believe me, technology companies will be listening. If you do this, together we can design a world where all technologies help us flourish. Thank you.